Hello everyone, Steve here from Tech Toy Tinker and Retro Arena. I'm going to do a video today that's going to be a little bit lengthy and you're going to have to pay attention to a lot of the details because I'm going to go over a lot of information and this will pertain to the AIA Retro Power and AIA Neo Ubuntu 20 LTS build. So this build runs from a USB stick or if you're like me and you've got a USB-C hub with an SD or micro SD adapter it will run from there too and if you've pre-ordered the AN Neo dock it's got the reader there it will also work there as well you can install it to the internal storage if you do wish that's a whole different procedure that we're not going to go over in this video but basically if you just wanted Ubuntu and not Windows you would just completely erase the internal storage while running from the USB and then copy the image file or the D, you would DD the SD over, or USB over to the internal. Or if you wanted to dual boot both, you would partition, say, 50 gigabytes or 100 gigabytes for Ubuntu and put it there, and then play with the boot partition manager and set everything up yourself. I'll work on a much easier way of doing that in the future, but this is just an alpha build for now. So moving forwards, you've flashed it to whatever you're going to flash it to, USB, SD, you've popped it into your device the first thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to boot the windows bios manager or uefi i think it is bios manager and to do that i don't remember if it's escape or f2 but it's one of those i usually just press them both and it gets me in there so you want to do this with your usb stick or device connected and you want to go to the right a couple times to boot now the screen will be sideways on the bios that's a known thing doesn't matter you just turn your head a little bit you can see you go over to boot change it from windows to ubuntu and then you save it and you go back to the next step of everything which is basically just going to let your device reboot and you'll be booted into linux now the first thing you're going to see as soon as you boot linux is this screen now granted it's not going to have all these systems here because well you have to use your own games but you will see this screen it'll have an options menu and a couple of things on it and not much else in there because of the fact that you don't have any games. The options menu can be used to bring up the Retro Arena menu. I'll just show you quickly. Retro Arena setup. A lot of you who are familiar with Retro Pi and other distros will be familiar with the Run Command GUI. Um, it's actually not on this screen because I have HDMI plugged in right now. As you can see, there's a second monitor right above. I just wanted to show you guys that that worked, but I can get back into that at a different point and just unplug it for now. And it should make the device default. Yeah, there we go. Now, normally, when you turn the device on from a fresh boot, you won't have this terminal in the background. It's only here because I already had the device on and I launched Emulation Station manually that way. So you launch Aries Setup or Retro Arena Setup and you're greeted by this. Here you can update all of your cores, your emulators, RetroArch itself. You can play with your settings, so if you want to play with your different launching images, if you want to reset your controls, play with the RetroArch settings, all that is in here. You can also directly launch the RetroArch GUI from here, and a host of other things. You can update your themes, you can download themes from Hursty. So that being said, you're going to want to exit this upon first boot. Quit Emulation Station, you can use the touchscreen. I plugged in a mouse and keyboard just to make it easier for the video, but the touchscreen does work and it's properly enabled. The drag comes from where you select. So, we've got Dolphin. You should use this before you launch it from Emulation Station only one time if you want to change Vulkan to GL or anything like that. PCSX2 launches directly from Emulation Station, but if you wanted the GUI to play with stuff, it's here. The same is true with XEMU and Citra. Cody here is exactly what you think it is. The controller support here has been strange setting up, and it's not ready yet, but because this is a touchscreen device, it's kind of a moot point. It's really irrelevant. Also, these keys are... So you press Win. I thought this was clever. When you press the Win key... It just brings up the different windows. And then you can do what you're going to do. So if you wanted to exit it, you would just click the X. Apparently my big fingers don't want it. There we go. With that being said, I'm going to go over some important information. A lot of it is contained in this particular document. 
but I've been, as this is an in-progress build, I've obviously discovered a couple of new things since I worked this all out. This here is how I got the Wi-Fi to work. This here is how you resize, or how I resized the SD. If that doesn't work, you can use G-parted as well. So now, some of you are going to ask, or are going to ask for sure, why I can see my Windows partition. I did that on purpose, and I'm going to talk about that right now. So, if we were to go here, and go home, Aries, and then, see, my ROMs and BIOS are linked. The reason for that is because I have everything set up for my emulation station build in Windows, and it would be kind of redundant to set it up twice. Now, if you're just using Linux, or if you want to, you can obviously use the pre-included ROMs and BIOS folders, which will give you the structures of the files you need. I won't give you the files, obviously, but it'll give you the folder structure. What I did, however, was I went over to Terminal, and I typed in sudo fdisk minus l which will show you all the different disks, devices, drives, and I scrolled up till I found the Windows one. Now you see how this is 941.1 gigabytes? That's the name of the device. What I did was I went to my main, so I pressed CD to go change directory right to the main folder where Aries, Aries setup, all that is, and I made a folder named mount. Then I typed in sudo, not slash, sorry, sudo mount mount. If you're not in the directory where your mount folder is located, you just type home tectoy tinker mount. It's not gonna, it's already done, so it's not gonna work. But that's the command. So then after you do that, you go into mount, and that is your C drive from Windows that is now mounted in Linux. Now from here, you can mount the rest. So we go CD Aries. And you see that those folders are linked. What I did was I deleted both the ROMs and BIOS folder completely from the Linux distribution, and I typed sudo ln minus s slash home slash tech toy tinker slash mount slash emulation station slash BIOS slash home slash tech toy tinker slash Aries slash BIOS. And what this will do is this will create a symbolic link from your mount point to these folders. And so then you don't have to do everything twice. Emulation Station on Linux will just see it all as soon as you boot from your, lin from your Windows directories. You can change this to ROMs as well after you enter the first command and change that to ROMs as well to do the same for the ROMs folder. I'm going to leave that on the screen for a second there sudo ln minus s home tectoy tinker mount emulation station roms space slash home slash tectoy tinker slash aries slash roms this will create the link point now at this point you'll be able to launch emulation station and see all of your games but when you reboot the links will be gone so to stop yourself from having to remount it every time you're going to type in cron tab minus e and you're going to press page down to get to the very bottom and when there's a blank space, you're going to enter at reboot space sudo space mount space, and then you're going to want to copy and paste from your fdisk minus l slash dev slash nvme 0 n 1 p 4 space slash home slash tech toy tinker slash mount. Then you press control O to save and control X to exit it. At this point, this will all work now upon reboot. So you restart, and if you're booting Linux, you'll have access to all of your games and BIOS from Windows over here. Now, one other step that I want to point out that makes this process easier, because if you just do this at face value, what's going to happen is it will still mount your drive for you, but it's going to tell you that because Windows is in hibernation mode, that it is read-only. So you won't be able to save things to the, at that particular storage or drive. You'll only be able to read them from it which will still allow you to play your games, but it, it gets in the way of saving XML files and things like that, which you might not want it to do. It depends on you. Now, with all of that being said, the easiest way that I've found to correct this issue is simply to turn off fast boot in Windows. What that does is it stops Windows from entering hibernation on shutdown and just completely shuts it down, and this will free up the drive for Linux to use as well. 
So you've gone ahead and done all of that. Now you can simply reboot your device. And upon reboot, which I'm actually going to show you, you'll have exactly what I do, which is booting directly into Emulation Station with all of your games and all of your BIOS configured. If you don't want to do all of this stuff, you can simply just flash it to a bigger drive than 32 gigabytes, and then you can... Oh yeah, also this is still sideways, much like it is in Windows, I'm working on that. So anyways, if you don't want to do that, you can flash to a bigger drive than 32 gigabytes and use Gparted or Linux to expand the size of the drive and fill the file system, and then you can use like a 128 gigabyte storage, which is what I'm doing via the micro SD reader here in my USB hub. And then you can put all the games and stuff into Linux directly if that's what you wish to do. Now as you can see, the device is booted into Emulation Station. And all of my games and everything are already here. But none of this is on Linux, this is all on my Windows partition. And so far, going back and forth playing the games, the editing to the XML files hasn't done any damage or any harm nor has the save game files. Because if the save game files weren't the same format, they would have a different format or extension to being saved anyways, like SO versus DLL for RetroArch cores in Windows, as an example. That's all fine and dandy. Uh, this is not an emulation video per se right now, so I'm not actually going to show a bunch of gameplay, except for PS3. The reason why I'm going to show you PS3 is because I've actually found that it works better in Linux than it does on Windows, and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean in a way that you guys can compare on your own. Now, if you have this game, which a lot of people do, and it's why I'm using this game, you'll notice that in Windows, past the opening screen, the entire intro or animation is incredibly choppy and laggy. And when you play it in Linux, there's still some of that lag or chop, but it's intermittent and it clears up pretty quickly. That doesn't really happen in Windows. It's laggy until you're inside the game. It's just an example of the performance difference. It's not amazingly different, but it's enough to be noteworthy. Keeping in mind too, I'm all. This is all being run from uh, the OS is being run from here. It's on a micro SD card. Now it'll clear up in a moment. Whereas on Windows, it keeps on being laggy until you start the game. Just something worth noting. I will give you guys a look at what's in here. I'm just not going to launch any more games because it's got nothing to do with the purpose of the video, really, other than to show you what exists. And to give Hursty a shout-out, actually, because Hursty came back and did some... There was some stuff missing from this theme, like Thompson, Uzbox, Lutro, and he, he added to the theme for us so it would be more complete... The one that is missing in here isn't because it's missing, it's because I have to rename a file. That's a text file, though, it's easily done. As you can see up here, I have my Wi-Fi connected. That's 5G, that's 2G. Here's my hub. As you can see, there's just a mouse and keyboard connected. There's where the HDMI goes, there's where the SD is, or, and there's a or micro SD, there's an SD reader. There's no dongles or anything connected to the device. So we have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The internal chips are working properly. And now I'll go to the part of the video where I discuss the HDMI. Because though it does work, there's just a way you have to set it up, so I may as well just explain it. I'm going to connect it now. So, when you first connect your HDMI, this screen is going to flip sideways. It's not broken, it's not a big deal. You go join displays, one and two, and you click on this one. 
You see, I've got this as portrait. You probably can't see because it's so small. I've got it as portrait left. Display 2, which is what you're connecting to HDMI as landscape. That's fine. The built-in display needs to be switched to portrait left when you're playing in HDMI mode here. Not a big deal, I just figured I would explain that because someone's inevitably going to ask why their screen is sideways and how to fix it, and so now you've got the answer. As far as that goes, that's about the a large chunk of what you need to know about the functionality of this and how it works. I've noticed it is a bit snappier than Windows at times. Things do run a little bit better. We do have Steam here as well. Steam will take a moment to open, but it will open. And another feature that I've been testing and I really like about this device, which I should show you while I have you here, is the big box mode of Steam. You can set it so that this becomes the mouse control and things like that. I don't know how to do that without showing you my... That works. Right, so here's Steam. As you can see, I didn't show it in the other video, I just showed the login menu. There's actual Steam working. I should point out that this is not big box mode. But as you can see, it does work fine. And you can launch it in big box mode, or big screen mode, whatever you want to call it. I think it's actually called big box mode. But Bluetooth also works. As you can see, the devices are here. Because this is an alpha build, it will be updated continuously. And I'm also very much open to you, the user or the community, responding, whether it's on Discord, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's here in the YouTube comment section. If you find any quirks or bugs that need fixing, be sure you do let us know so we can get them dealt with sooner as opposed to later. But with this build, you're getting an alternative to Windows, something you can boot parallel to Windows, something that will allow certain emulators to run a little bit better because they work better on Linux. This will allow you to use Spine PS4, which is an early development, but you have to have a modded PS4 console. That's the only catch. Without it, you're never going to get it to work, and I won't provide any of the files because they're from my console. But it does seem to run a little bit better for me than Linux or Windows, rather. Sorry, I do like Windows, and it does work fine on this device, but if I have to choose, I'm going to probably pick Linux. I will be working on other versions of Linux as well. Somebody has requested that I look at Pop as well as Mint, so I'm going to be looking into those as well. Um, the 5.15 kernel is important because it has a lot of the necessary AMD things that this build requires. I'm going to wrap the video up with that because it's getting a little bit long. I just wanted to give you guys an introduction to Ubuntu on this device and show you a little bit about how it worked. As always, thank you for watching. This image will be released later today as well. Take care. Don't forget to like and subscribe.